Welcome back for more AP Biology. We're going to be taking a slight detour off of the normal path of looking at how genes are expressed. And now we're going to deal with a little bit of how can we manipulate that gene expression? So how can we manipulate genes? This is something that they like to test, if you haven't figured that out. <laughs> and obviously, there's some references. So. In order for us to really talk about this, what we need to have a firm grasp on is how we express our genes. So it helps if we know how we replicate DNA, how we go through transcription, how we go through translation. It helps if we know something about viruses. It also helps if we know something about how we control our genes, meaning gene expression regulation. We're going to try this without all of those pieces this could be a failure. So one of the things that we've been, that some people like to talk about is, well, look at these humans, you know, making their GMOs and GMOs are bad. We shouldn't have any GMOs. When the proper response is we've actually, we humans have been making GMOs for a very long time. The catch is we just did it through artificial selection, through breeding. We didn't do it by gene manipulation. We did it by breeding manipulation, but they are genetically modified organisms. And we've been doing this, like I said, as long as we've had domestication, whether we were domesticated or some, we're domesticating something else. We have done this. So the only difference is the tool and how quickly we can make this happen. So one of the first things that we can do is we can chop up DNA. We can do this by using what we call blunt end or sticky end restriction using a substance called a restriction enzyme. So what restriction enzymes do, and they're named like ALU1 and HEI3 and BAMH1, HINDI3, ECOR1. I don't know why this thing is now freaking out at me, so let's not touch that mouse. So when we look at this, even though now I'm pointing at a screen, you can't see me pointing at it, is like if I look at ALU1, what it turns out to do is cut at the sequence of A, G, C, T. BAM H1 will cut at the sequence G, G, A, T, C, C. EcoR1 will cut at the sequence G, A, A, T, T, C. Those are the locations of where the actual cut occurs. Okie dokie. Why would we do this? Well, this is a bacterial mechanism to destroy anything that enters into the cell, whether it's virus, DNA, or some other foreigner. So it's a defense mechanism. So when I look at ALU, what I happen to notice if I look at it is AGCT. That's 5 prime to 3 prime. But what if we approach this from the opposite side? So we use the bottom strand that says TCGA. Well, that's being read backwards of 3 prime to 5 prime. If I read the bottom strand, 5 prime to 3 prime, I get AGCT, which is the exact same as the top. These sequences, these restriction sites, are referred to as palindromes, which is one of their giveaways, that they're palindromes. The top two, the ALU and the HEI3, what those will end up doing is creating what we call blunt ends, meaning they're, they don't do anything. You can't, they just chop. The bottom three, the BAM, HINDI, and ECO, what those will do is create what we call sticky ends, meaning if I have two locations I cut with BAM H1, I can glue them together because they have the exact same sequence. If I have two locations cut by ECOR1, I can glue them together because they have the exact same sequence. What we have introduced is an ability to cut DNA and re-glue the pieces together. Hmm. But we have also just recently learned of some more technology referred to as CRISPR-Cas9. And the super easy version of this is Cas well, CRISPR, the entire sequence. What it can do is it can target not just a few nucleotides, but long segments of DNA. And the result of that is it can cut at that very specific location. Because the more nucleotides you have, the more specific you can be as to what you're looking at. So using this, we could target a very specific location, 
chop all of it out, and then we could put in a brand new piece of DNA. This one doesn't let us just chop. We can chop and immediately replace with something brand new, which is something beyond what restriction enzymes do. And there's lots of controversy and research going into this as well. First thing we can do, we, can, we know how we can chop up DNA and potentially recombine it. Well, what if I could put this into bacteria? Bacteria turn out to have their chromosomes, so they have their big piece of DNA, but they also have smaller pieces of DNA called plasmids. And what we can do is chop up a plasmid with restriction enzymes, and if we match up the restriction enzymes, I could then move a gene from whatever organism you wish to talk about and put it into a plasmid. And that plasmid I could then use for transformation, which is changing the phenotype of a bacterium. Whenever we make a plasmid, especially for genetic recombination, I have to have three things. I need to have an origin of replication, I need to have the gene in question, and I need to have what we call a selectable marker, meaning I need to have a way to know, did the organism, the bacterium, get my plasmid? Did they get what I wanted it to get? The way you do that, typically, is you use antibiotic resistance, meaning I take a whole bunch of bacteria, I try and shove the plasmid into them. I'm, again, I'm now going to grow these on plates. I only want to use the plate to grow the bacteria that happen to have this plasmid. I don't want to waste my time with the ones that didn't pick up the plasmid. Well, how could I do this? If I put the bacteria onto this plate, but also on this plate I have an antibiotic, in this particular case ampicillin, AMP is ampicillin, what that will do is it will kill all of the bacteria that do not happen to have that plasmid. If you picked up the plasmid, you get to live. If you don't pick up the plasmid, you don't get to live. What's the result? The result turns out to be I only will have bacteria growing that were transformed, thus making my life a little bit easier. The process of the transformation depends. We're going to do a simple version called a heat shock. In college, I did one called an electroporation, and then I used an organism that can also cause transformation called agrobacterium. We don't get to do those last two because agrobacterium is a plant pest and electroporation is a major pain in the butt and we have nothing close to the equipment needed to do it, although I would like it, but details. So when I take that recombinant, recombinant plasmid, meaning it has different parts to it, and I stick it inside of the host cell and I have a transformation, what I now have is an ability to express a trait I couldn't before. But how do I know that I chopped up my DNA correctly? How do I know that I made the plasmid correctly? One of the test procedures that we have is called electrophoresis. Electrophoresis is a piece of jello that's made out of sugar instead of protein. And what you can do is put your DNA samples into the top, into things that we call wells. And when I electrocute it in a salty solution called a running buffer, what I will do is separate out the DNA by size. The heaviest pieces will stay up at the top, and the lightest pieces will be able to make it through the maze of the sugar, the agarose, and reach the bottom first. The sizes of these bands, so you see some of them are big fat bands, some of them are skinny. Typically, they could be big fat bands because things are smearing, or there's just a whole lot of DNA there. It could be one of the two. When I also look at this thing, the way that these move, if I were to compare how far they move and their size, it turns out to be an exponential function. So the graph that we make is actually a logarithmic graph. I figured you all would appreciate that. Okay, so I know how to chop up the DNA. I know how to recombine it. I know how to stick it into a bacterium. I know how to verify that there's stuff there. But what if I only have a little bit of something and I want to make more? turns out there's a technique for that too. It's referred to as the polymerase chain reaction or PCR. It involves three steps. Step number one is I take my DNA and I rip it open. We call that denaturation. Step two is I need to repl start replicating. But in order to replicate, I need a three prime end. Where does that come from? A primer. So if I wanted to replicate DNA, we have three billion base pairs in our DNA. 
I don't want to replicate all 3 billion base pairs. I probably only want to replicate one little segment of it, maybe 200 base pairs. So the job of the primers is they will say, here's the start of where I want to look, and here's the end to where I want to look. So they're setting up the parameters. We call that annealing. And then we will elongate this thing using polymerase. And then we'll repeat this. And what eventually you'll end up doing is replicating only that little itty bitty section that you wanted to replicate with our forward and reverse primers or the starter endpoints. This process takes about 90 seconds per stage and it used to be done by hand, which means this cycle, which takes 30 of them to basically make anything quantifiable, you can go from one copy to a million copies within 30 cycles. The problem that we end up having with this is it, it's going to take you too long because you have to be fixing everything by hand. And the reason why you have to do it by hand is when you go from the extending stage to the denaturing stage, you destroy your DNA polymerase. So an enzyme was found called Thermus aquaticus, and it has a heat-stable DNA polymerase that we call TAC polymerase, T-A-Q for TAC, because Thermus aquaticus. And the result of that is we can do this entire process within an hour. And we can do cycle sequencing in an, or not cycle sequencing, but we can do PCR within an hour. We've saved unfathomable amounts of time and resources. The person who figured this out, Kerry Mullis, he is now rich and you have to pay whenever you wish to do this process. But it's so much faster than it used to be. Well, how do we know what the parts are? Well, we could sequence it. This makes use of how DNA replicates. So if I have a piece of DNA and I want it to replicate, so I have what I want to replicate, what I'm going to do is part of it is going to replicate. But if I randomly throw in stopping points, meaning if I throw in nucleotides that do not happen to have a three prime end, a dideoxynucleotide, a DDNTP, what I could end up doing is I can actually cause this thing to stop. Why would I do that? Well, if I only had a few of those dideoxynucleotides, a few of those stopping points, what I can end up doing is I will randomly have stops thrown in. So much so that if I did this enough, every possible place I could have a stop, I will have a stop. Meaning I could stop after the first nucleotide, oh, stop after the second nucleotide, third nucleotide, fourth nucleotide, fifth, sixth, seventh, tenth, hundredth nucleotide. I can have all of those different stopping points. But those stopping points aren't useful to us unless I know where did they stop. So what if I were to add a little color to them, such that all the adenines had one color, and all the cytosines had one color, and guanines had a different color, and the thiamines had another color? Then all I would need to do is look at the order of the colors. And we call that an electropherogram, which is this particular picture. Each of those peaks that you see turns out to be a color that's showing up. The higher the peak, it's the better it turned out to be. But what you ultimately get are these high peaks, and those peaks are telling you, here's what the sequence is. It's not perfect, because if you look at the bottom one, it goes CCM, M meaning we're not sure which one this is. You might want to double check it. But what we can end up getting is a sequence. We can sequence our DNA. So I can chop up DNA, I can recombine it, I can put it into a bacterium, I can verify that the pieces are there in terms of size, I can even sequence it and make more copies. What else can I do? Turns out we can also figure out what all those genes do. We know we have 20 to 25,000 genes in the human genome. We don't know what they all do. We just know, oh, they have the right parts, therefore this is a gene. How do we figure out what they do? Well, one of those easiest things that we could do is something called a gene chip. So this is a picture of a gene chip. I don't have mine here. I showed it in class. What it turns out to have are a whole bunch of little wells or little spots where we could have DNA placed. So you place DNA onto those, or you could use RNA. It doesn't really matter. But you put nucleic acid on, and you know where those happen to come from. Okay, so what I can do is take this 
plate or this chip with DNA on it that we happen to know about, I can then take DNA or RNA from a cell where it's expressing a particular trait. So we know, oh, the cell is making this protein at this time. I wonder what gene that turns out to be. Well, if it's making a certain protein, there's going to be RNA present. So if I were to take that RNA and I turned out to tag it with stuff, meaning I made it radioactive or I made it so it glowed, and I then washed it over my gene chip, the parts that turn out to be complementary or the parts that are being expressed will attach themselves to whatever matching pieces of DNA or RNA are on the gene chip. So on the gene chip, I happen to have the stuff I know where it came from. I take a cell that's expressing some trait. I take the nucleic acid from that that's being expressed. If I radioactively tag it or I fluorescently tag it, I wash it over my gene chip. If any of these turn out to pair up, they will. And the result is when you run a scanner over it, parts of it will light up. The result of part of it lighting up is we got a match. So if I know where I got a match, I can now start to wonder, is this the gene that is expressing that RNA, which is making that protein? And it's a way of trying to connect gene to the cellular response. But we could do this another way, an old fashioned way, and that's what we call a knockout. So what I could do is actually take a different system this one was referred to as RNAi or RNA interference. And what you end up creating is a different type of RNA called an SI or small interfering RNA. What that will do is target RNA and then you destroy the RNA. What you end up doing is you create, like I said, a knockout, meaning I'm going to prevent the RNA from doing its thing. I'm going to make sure that I disable mRNA. Well, why would I do that? I could then watch and see what the response is. If I take out this gene, what happens to the cell? What deficit is it now going to have? And based upon what now goes wrong, I can probably figure out what that gene did because I saw what happens when you don't have that gene, which is clever. Unfortunately, to deal with any more application when you talk viruses a little bit. So viruses, really simple from the past, they're protein and nucleic acid. Sometimes they happen to have a coat on the outside, but not always. And when they replicate, they're going to replicate in one of two ways. One of them we call the lytic cycle, which is the bacterium will attach, inject its DNA or RNA. That will cause it to destroy the cell's DNA. And the point of doing that is just so that the cell focuses on expressing viral traits. What's going to happen? The virus is going to make more viruses, and it's going to make so many of them that eventually they explode out of the cell, hence lysis, or the lytic cycle. There's another option, and that is the bacterium, or pardon me, the virus will inject its genetic information, and rather than it destroying your cell's DNA, it integrates into your DNA. So whenever that cell replicates, the virus replicates. And it will keep doing this until it has a reason to think something bad is happening. When it feels that there's stress or the organism might die, the virus will pop out of the viral of your genome. The result of that will be lysis. So it's going to go through the lytic cycle until it explodes out. If you have cold sores or kinker sores, you have a form of herpes, not the sexual version, but you have a form of herpes. And what it does is the lysogenic cycle. It hopped inside of your mouth into skin cells there, and it just replicates with your skin cells. And when it feels like it's freaking out, it goes, I'm jumping ship. It undergoes the lytic cycle, and the result is you get those blisters. And that's where the viruses are trying to break out. And it's just waiting for you to add saliva to the wrong individual. And voila, we've spread it. There's a different version of all of this, and that's what we call a retrovirus. Retroviruses use RNA, and they turn RNA into DNA through a process called reverse transcription. That process is prone to make all sorts of mistakes, and the result of that is 
the virus that infects the cell will not necessarily be the same as the virus that leaves the cell. And that's because reverse transcription induces lots of mutations. The result, it's going to be really hard to figure out what this virus is and to stop it, at least with our normal means. The way that the virus turns out to do its job, meaning you only care about me, is the one of the parts of a gene is referred to as a promoter. And this promoter thing, what it does is it's its sole purpose is to say, RNA polymerase, bind here, don't you want to bind here? And it turns out viruses have unbelievably amazing promoters. Meaning, if a viral promoter is put onto a gene, you're going to express that gene. Because the viral promoter is going to do whatever it can to make the gene become expressed. So, whenever we are trying to genetically alter organisms, Typically, if I want that trait to be expressed, I add a viral promoter. The result is I can generate a genetically modified organism through non-reproductive means, and I'm going to make sure that I am expressing that trait because that viral promoter will ensure it. GMOs turn out to be all over the place, the types that we did the old-fashioned way and the modern version. Are all of them evil? No. Are some of them evil? Yes. But are is it the GMO that's evil or is it the company behind it? Insert debate here. We can use these things to make genetically modified organisms, which may or may not be to our benefit. But we also can use biotechnology, this manipulation of genes and how they work, to create stem cells. Stem cells we can use to build all sorts of things. You lost part of your liver, let's see if we could rebuild you a liver. You lost part of your brain due to a stroke, let's see if we could rebuild part of your brain for a stroke. You had a heart attack and part of your cardiac muscles dead, let's see if we can build you a new part. That's one of the promises of stem cells. Doesn't mean that's going to be the ultimate response, but there's an option out there. But in order to get stem cells to exist, you need to reprogram your cells, meaning I can either take them from an organism, meaning, as you can see from here, I can make an embryo and start stealing cells from there. Or what I can do, and this picture doesn't show it, is I can take skin cells or brain cells or heart cells or whatever, and I can reverse engineer them so they go backwards to being stem cells. And that's all done through genetic manipulation. Obviously, all of this has issues. And the emergence of CRISPR has really started a lot of people worrying about genetic manipulation and GMOs and things like that, especially because CRISPR is so much of a game changer in terms of I can target very specific pieces of DNA, chop it out, and replace that there's going to be a lot of questions that are going to be asked about GMOs. Are they all evil? No. Do we have some potential to cause trouble? Absolutely. It's one of the things that makes us human. One of the things that you're going to be doing with all of this is you're going to be doing something called a BLAST search. And I'm, I'll have a separate video on how you use BLAST. But BLAST, so the basic local alignment of sequences, test or tool or something like that. It's a government website that just contains DNA sequences. Or it could have RNA sequences or protein sequences. But what we can use it for is comparing values. So you have a lab that you're going to be doing that's going to utilize this. Actually, you're going to do a few labs that utilize this concept. And like I said, I have a separate video on how do you actually go about doing this. But these are the things we can do off the top of my head to manipulate the expression of genes.